And welcome back. We'll get right into it. Our very first guest grew up as the daughter of immigrants and learning early in life the importance of hard work and community. She's proudly helped lead the fight for critical reform, including prohibiting racial profiling, funding gang prevention programs, and increasing grand jury transparency, as well as ensuring speedy trials and fixing the city's broken bail system. Joining us now to share a little bit more on this matter, I'm joined by New York State Assembly Member of District 80, Natalia Fernandez. And Natalia, good to have you. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Glad to have you sharing with us. And uh, so tell us a little bit as we are getting into the thick of things here, getting close towards the summertime. A lot of things are still on the horizon, but most of all, really, all of us are still trying to navigate through COVID-19. So give us a little bit of insight as to where your district is right now in regards to COVID-19. Well, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for having me on this morning. Well, my oh, district, uh, my district, the 80th Assembly District right here in the Northeast Bronx um, has been hard, hit hard by COVID. Uh, my district is central, if not surrounding, to many healthcare facilities, including major hospitals, Jacoby, Montefiore, North Central Bronx, Einstein, and numerous uh, nursing homes, Pelham Parker Nursing Home, Morris Park Nursing Home, Morningside. So when the pandemic hit, it really shook us up a lot. And early on, we saw infection rates very high right here in our district, 10469 zip code, 10467 zip code. So the urgency was immediate to get assistance to our healthcare professionals that early on were not getting the proper protective equipment like masks and gloves and PPEs. I partnered with community groups to help give those uh, products, you know, as we had them. And then also seeing how we can fight the food insecurity that hit a lot of people abruptly. Many people had to stop working, were furloughed, lost their jobs, had to halt their business, and it became a real dire uh, need for, for food to, to survive. So yeah. working with um, companies like uh, Great Performances Catering, ICNA Relief, doing as many pop-ups as we can throughout the district just to help Bronx sites uh, as best as we could before we got to legislation um, that was really needed to help pause evictions because with no money and no job, people couldn't pay their rents. And we had to make sure that, you know, they weren't losing their homes because of it, but also helping the small businesses as best as we could. And it has been a, a long battle. This has been a long year. Um, we're now hitting the one year mark of it, but I'm very grateful for the work that we did accomplish last year and recently to help get rent relief programs, $100 million from the last stimulus package. Now in this budget, we got another $500 million for rent relief and also a billion dollars for small businesses to help with uh, their rent and utility bills. Well, let's unpack a little bit of that right there. When you talk about where we are, um, as a people, first of all, we know that the number is really high in your district, right? So are you satisfied with what you're seeing by way of vaccination rollout and the amount of people being vaccinated so far? Um, no, not immediately. It was uh, something that I have been you know, working on since the vaccine became available. And we're fortunate that Jacoby Hospital and North Central Hospital or, you know, our hospitals here had the vaccine, but in communities that, you know, where populations still had difficulty traveling to the hospitals or even Yankee Stadium, which was a big help for the Bronx that I was the first to call for it, to say that we need a mass vaccination site and it should be somewhere like Yankee Stadium. It was still very difficult for my district to get there. So I had been pushing and fighting and, and asking everybody under the sun, the governor, the mayor, and any healthcare uh, agency institution to bring vaccination sites to my community centers, to my senior centers, to the catering hall that has not been open for months, for a year. And unfortunately, we couldn't get many of those um, acts completed. But as time went on and the vaccine became more available, our local health care providers have been able to administer it. So now just this week, I partnered up with VIP Community Health Services to bring a pop-up vaccine site right at Columbus High School in the center of the 80th. Yeah. I want to talk about businesses in your district as well, because when we talk about uh, COVID-19, we know that the high impact, particularly on small businesses. You look at the borough of the Bronx, we're made up of a lot of small businesses and particularly right there in your district. A lot of them said, listen, when it came to PPP and the opportunity to get that paycheck uh, protection program, they were denied the opportunity. And now small business is really looking and asking a question, where do we go from here? Um, what answers can you give them? 
Well, the state application has still to be released and it should be in the next couple uh, weeks. And I say like, you know, couple, very few, but they, there is an application that will be available for small business owners that have not been able to pay rent, that have not been able to pay utilities, even some payroll to, to employees and to help them catch up on the debt that they've been accumulating. But our small businesses have been hurting in so many other ways as well. You know, the shutdown put strict regulations, uh, you know, either close your doors to strict hours, must wear masks, must have all proper, um, you know, safety precautions in place. And many businesses did comply, but in the beginning, there was an issue with uh, language transparency. So a lot of this information was not available in the language of the business owner um, at times, and it caused confusion and it caused them to get fined and it just now added to their debt. And our restaurants too have been suffering a lot with this. Um, understanding, you know, that it was very, very critical early on to not have restaurants open, but the, the lack of, of patronage and, and, you know, customers certainly pushed them back. Um, not every restaurant could do delivery. And then when outside dining started, not every little restaurant had a space for outside dining. So there is certainly a need to want more hours of business. Um, and with all safety precautions in place, you know, I know a lot of people are ready and have complied and can do it, but it's just also a factor that and this is the small businesses speaking to me that they feel that, you know, the agencies have been a little overbearing and looking for any reason to find them. And there have been restaurants that have been closed early on, got fined $25,000 and still are not able to open and still owe that money. So that's right. something that I wanted to look into. Why are we now holding them with this debt for something that necessarily wasn't intentionally to hurt anybody, you know? Right. So yeah. it's, it's certainly an uphill battle and for the, the relief that is to come in, in various ways in the city and the state, we want to just get that information and help them fill out the paperwork, guide them through it, because a lot of it's complicated and a lot of it, you need records from years past and payroll, um, you know, payroll uh, uh, histories to show for it. So getting all that information together is something that a lot of our businesses need help on, because especially the small business owners, it's only one employee. So right. imagine them trying to run their business, do everything that they have to do to keep compliance, and then also get everything together for uh, the relief uh, applications. It's certainly a lot for them. Yeah. I want to talk about community for a moment, because obviously in our community, there's still a lot of quality of life issues. One, across New York City, the rise in anti-Semitic hate. Uh, you know, the fact that there's so many people uh, who are still perpetrating hate these days is something we, don't, we shouldn't have to be talking about. But yet and still, it's happening. And it's happening uh, in the Jewish community prevalently. It's happening in the Asian community. Uh, so give me a little bit about your take on particularly those two areas and what we're seeing. Well, it's incredibly sad that we are still seeing these instances, especially to the Jewish community. And recently, when it was Holocaust Memorial Day, I was so shocked to see on social media and even in some conversations that people don't believe the Holocaust happened. So you know, that could be a reason why there is continued hate, because we're not talking about what had happened before when we let the hate go uh, array. Um, so it's, 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 it's terribly uh, sad to see and something that we must be vigilant about, continue to stand up against it, to continue to call it out. And as much as we can uh, get it to the masses on social media and news on TV, educate our neighbors that this is not what we are about. This is not what we can allow to happen. Um, because if you let one community get attacked, any community is open to attack. And look what's happening to our Asian and Pacific Islander community. Um, unfortunately, rhetoric, I think, by our former president has led to this hate, this animosity towards our Asian community members, and it's resulting in harm. And we have to keep standing against it. Do you believe that uh, in terms of just public, you know, being able to get along and, and being the COVID is kind of like also exacerbated our tensions between racial and just, you know, day to day dialogue between people that so many people have COVID fatigue. Now, I'm not using that as an excuse, but I'm also saying it's also a part of what I think people are navigating with that, that translates in some of this behavior. I could agree on that because, yes, COVID has gave everybody anxiety, has given a lot of people, you know, paranoia of what tomorrow can look like, what, what's going to happen to me today, um, what can happen to my neighbor next week. So that, that pent up anger emotion, a lot of people have it. 
And I can't say that that is a reason, but I could believe, yeah, it's something tied to it as a result of COVID and what it's done to our, you know, our social lives, our ability to, you know, be around and learn from your neighbor has certainly been restricted. So I, I yeah, I could say that there is a tie to that. Uh, you talked about what tomorrow looks like. I want to talk about what tomorrow looks like uh, for you. Uh, you have a desire to see a greener Bronx and uh, you've got a greener plan. I want you to take the time to let a little bit of our viewers know exactly how you see this greener plan playing out for the borough of the Bronx. Absolutely. Well, I have this plan for the Bronx, um, for the whole borough, not just the 80th, because I am running for Bronx Borough President. But this is an area that we must be vigilant on and we must come at bold and strong and really work towards real solutions. The Bronx has a long history of environmental injustices. Environmental racism has really left our community suffering. You know, we have Asthma Alley here because of the infrastructure that has been built um, that is allowing emissions and cars to stay in our communities and stay in the air. And we need to really address that and look at solutions. Like many of my colleagues and myself have been talking, capping the cross Bronx to stop the emissions from coming into our neighborhoods, but also bringing renewable energies um, and new infrastructure, green infrastructure that will not only help the borough stay healthy, purify the air and help, you know, our waterways and, and city systems, but also bringing jobs. You know, this is um, um, an, um, an economy a market that is here and we must utilize we must work towards getting it because if we don't we're losing on great opportunity to better our communities to bring jobs to our communities but really an opportunity of survival like we only got one planet we got one borough here and we need to make sure that we're absolutely taking care of it so the generations here and later don't grow up with the ailments that we see us uh, having like asthma and, and comorbidities. We're known as the Borough of Parks. The Bronx is, uh, you know, that borough that is known of many as having tremendous parks and beautiful parks. A lot of people are concerned about what's going to happen in the future by way of park space. Um, so can you address a little bit about, you know, what you think is going to happen by way of park space and what can we do to better improve the Bronx park space that we have? Absolutely. Thank you, because I love our park space. We are the greenest borough and tying into, you know, our, our green plan, we must have the greenest solutions. And I've been a strong advocate to say that as the borough with the most green space, we should have the highest parks budget because it's a lot of work to take care of our green space here, making sure that the ecosystems are, are healthy, making sure that, you know, our parks are clean, that they're not getting uh, hurt by the trash and, and contaminants that, you know, unfortunately some people leave and leave. So I wanna see our parks well taken care of, but also giving support to our community groups that have been taking care of our parks. Because as much as the budget has been hurt in different ways throughout the years, you know, less park workers, less um, park managers, less maintenance, less hours doing that. We have wonderful groups in our borough, friends of Mashalu Parkland, friends of um, Pelham Parkway, friends of Pelham Bay Park, um, Van Cortland Alliance. These are organizations that have dedicated their time um, and energy and, and sometimes you know their own money to make sure that our parks are kept clean and that everyone can enjoy them. So I think that we need to start helping them. And if it's with a little bit of funding um, to really continue the good work that we love in our in our parks, you know, expanding community gardens and getting people more interactive in their green space, maybe bringing up specific tours, walking days, you know, because there are trails within our parks that connect each other. So these are things that we should be promoting, we should be enjoying, and again, taking care of it. So pick up after yourselves, don't barbecue in the park, and make sure that you are leaving it better for yourself and for your neighbor. You mentioned a little bit earlier, stole my thunder a little bit, that you are running for Bronx Borough President. It's no secret. Uh, <laughs> we want to talk about that for a bit. You know, you, you got it. You stole my thunder, but it's all right. Um, so talk to us about your decision to wanting to run for Bronx Borough President and um, why you think you're the choice. Well, I love this borough. I absolutely do. This borough, like you said, I'm the daughter of immigrants. It gave my family life. It gave them a chance at the American dream. And it gave me... Um, a real purpose to really deliver for the people that I love and care about in my community, in my home. And in this time where it is such a pivotal moment for not just the Bronx, but New York City governance, 
we need bold leadership. We need new ideas. We need a fresh face, a new perspective, a different way of approaching things. And I know I am that candidate because that's how I've been since becoming an assembly member. I have the experience having worked in government my entire career, um, even at the executive level, being the Bronx uh, representative under the governor's office. So I'm the only candidate that served borough wide, but also one that has true energy to really address and be present for the borough. I am, am very proud to say that I have never lied to my community, misled them, um, always bringing full transparency into what I do and really leading with my heart and compassion. And that's what this borough needs right now. We need somebody who's going to love it, take care of it, nurture it, and really guide them to the future, to what we need to, where we need to be. You know, we have to get on this path of sustainability. We have to get back on track. We have so much potential here in the growth to come, um, but also with the, the talent and the originality that the Bronx continues to give to New York City. So I'm ready for the task. I have, I have the energy, the integrity, um, and again, the experience to make sure that the Bronx is never left behind. It is never second place. You'll always be hearing at the Boogie Down Bronx because shorty or not, I got my soapbox and I'm gonna come up and make sure you know what's going on in the Bronx and what we need. Uh, I think when you talk about the borough of the Bronx, obviously a lot of people will say, we're, we're doing better. And uh, there was once a time when the Bronx was burning, as the analogy is, and then we went from a place where the Bronx is booming. But now the big question, I mean, right now is coming out of COVID-19 is how are we going to be able to, how are we going to be able to fare? I mean, we're number 62 out of all, you know, out of all counties in terms of health. You've got the unemployment rate that is really, you know, that has seen better. But now with coming out of COVID-19, that could possibly drop back down again. What do you think is the biggest challenge for you, if elected, hitting that seat right off the gate that you'd have to tackle? Jobs and careers. That's something that I want Bronxites to uh, get every chance at, every opportunity for. And that starts at our education system, making sure that our children are fully supported in every area that they may need. Um, making sure that we have the after-school programs, the gifted and talented programs, the educational support, maybe having our buildings open later, our school buildings open later. You know, these are institutions, pillars in our community that should be utilized more. During the day, our kids can do their uh, nine to five of schoolwork, but then the second half of the day, we should open up these buildings for CTE courses, vocational courses, you know, the trades. This borough is developing and there's a lot of work to be done here and we want Bronxites to be a part of it. So we need workforce development uh, institutions, we need to bring job training and every project development to come. We need to make sure that they offer an apprenticeship program. So not only are we getting people a job to be in that project, but training them for the next job, setting up, setting themselves up for a career that they can carry with them throughout the city and throughout the borough, but also making sure that we are giving opportunity to a minority and small business owners. I mentioned before that we have great talent here. We have original new businesses. They need to be a part of these big plans because we want them to start and succeed here and then be able to take it to the rest of the borough. You know, we have restaurants, Caridad's, which is basically our, our own chain restaurant. I want to see more Caridad's and no more McDonald's. So I'm ready to empower the people of the Bronx, get them the proper education training that they need and get them working again and giving them the support that they need to get their doors open or to start a new business. And I intend to do that with my small business task force in conjunction with BOEDC, the Bronx Economic Development Corporation, because we need Bronx sites surviving and thriving. I got a little in two minutes, probably an unfair question, but I'm gonna throw, still, throw it in there. So much to talk about and thank you for that. Um, but police community relations, I mean, obviously that's huge too, right? Uh, you got about two minutes to unpack for me. You know, how do you envision police community relations going forward under your administration or even right now? Communication and accountability. That's the two areas that I think we need to focus on more to build better the, the relationship between police and community because we've seen the tension this last year and really the... The warrant, actually, yeah, the, the warranted attention to the issues that many people have been suffering for generations, um, un, unfair police tactics, lethal police tactics that should be limited. So we need to have the conversation um, in our communities between police and, and community about what change we want to see, what do we feel and how you need to be better. And that's something that I focused on in the assembly in my time. Um, I've introduced the Andrew Kears Act. It's a bill that was named after a Bronx resident, Andrew Kears, who died in the backseat of a police car while having a heart attack and was begging for life. I can't breathe. Please, officer, help me. Open the window. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. The officer laughed and scoffed him off and he died. So we need to change the mindset and 
really the training of police officers and how they treat us and how they approach situations. Not only should we be not giving the police every problem under the sun, you know, there are a lot of emergencies that don't need police force. Mental health crises we see all the time. We shouldn't be bringing a police officer with a gun to de-escalate, but that's not de-escalation. We need to really look at bringing healthcare professionals, mental health professionals into the rel into the ring uh, of these uh, crises to help people and not scare them and not hurt them. So I'm ready to tackle this head on to make sure that our CCRB, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, is strengthened and people are actually seeing justice, that police officers are held, are held accountable because like any area, any person, you do something wrong, you must be held accountable. That is justice. So the more, the more that we bring accountability into the police force, I think there will be further understanding and uh, a better pathway to peace. But the gun violence, we declare gun violence a public health uh, crisis here in the state because it is. It is literally killing people. You know, that's what guns do. Um, but we were fortunate to get $10 million more million into the state budget to help uh, community intervention programs. I really do believe it takes a village to raise anybody, to raise um, your neighbors, your community. And part of that is teaching each other, guiding each other. Sometimes a police officer isn't as, as welcoming or you know, giving that, that sense of comfort um, to some young people and, and others in general that you know, are going through life. There's so many things in life that bring a person to go to, 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 go, to choose violence. So our community intervention programs are made and run by people from the community that have lived these experiences that are aware of the conversations happening on the ground and can stop the violence before it happens. In my district, we have standing up to violence that we've seen statistically has lowered um, gun violence in, the, in its years of service. COVID-19, this past pandemic, you know, it surged through the roof. And I do believe a lot of it is because of the, the trauma that we felt and the yeah. struggle that we're going through. So attacking, you know, a addressing all this, I think we can get to a place where we are seeing less guns on the street, making sure we stop them from getting on the street. So gun manufacturers need to be held accountable too, because they need right. to control where their guns are going. And we need to guide people away from that life, more community centers, more job opportunities, youth development, and really getting the, the, the resources to the people. Natalia Fernandez, we're going to have to leave it there. Assembly member Natalia Fernandez, let me be correct. All right, thank you so much for joining us here on the Social Justice Forums. And of course, uh, you have an open door uh, to make sure to come on back and let us know what's going on in the district uh, and also how things are progressing with you uh, in the candidacy. Thank you so much for being with us here on the Social Justice Forums. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. And I will be back. All righty. Listen, we're taking a quick break. We have more show. Please don't go anywhere. We'll be back back with the social justice forums in a moment.